What's up everyone? Today we have an interview with Jacob Claver and I'll just do this intro and leave it here just to say Jake Claver is at the absolute cutting edge of what is possible with digital assets when it's related to wealth management, wealth creation, strategies for tax and company structure. He is the absolute forefront of all of these things. Make sure you're watching all the way to the end. We talk about one of the biggest opportunities that is coming to many of you in the coming months and it has to do with PolySign. Let's get into it. Now, I don't know if you watch the channel, you don't have to, I'm not saying you have to, um, but I've been diving really deep recently into documentation, UK law. I saw August 29th come up. Yeah. As a, as a date. <laughs> oh, that's for um, the, the Financial Services and Markets Bill to actually... Mm -hmm. uh, the digital settlement assets to come into play, actually into law, um, which is interesting, of course. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's it's things like that, diving into how basically all the banks around the world are completely focused on cross-border payments because that's where the biggest failings in the system are. Um, and the really the only solution to that properly is XRP, and they, they get discussed in all these documents. Um, and I'm just here reading reading multiple documents a day and reporting on them. So I'm like really getting into them. And it's awful, awesome, man. It just seems like it's just right, it's just right here. And then the the court case, what did David Schwartz say the other day? He said, if 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 the court case goes into September, then something fishy's going on or something like that. Do you remember that tweet? I mean, so Brad, Brad had said I don't remember if it was December last year or January this year, but the the course the court case would settle within the first single digit months. So, I mean, that that's September, right? Before September, I've I've felt like August. I mean, I sent people messages at the beginning of the year and end of last year that said August this year. Hmm. So, that's that's been my guess for a long time. Yeah. So what what do you think is going to happen initially then when when we get some resolution? Let's talk about the the positive case. I think I think there's three outcomes here. There's win, settlement and loss. Um I think settlement includes a bit of win and a bit of loss. Um what do you what do you think on the on the on the downside of things? It's called security specifically by one agency in one specific country. What do you think that does? I think it pisses the rest of the world off and they use it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. That's yeah, there it's like 90, 90 plus percent of of Ripple's partners and those that will use XRP for settlement are outside the US. Um you got BRICS looks as though they're coming together as a coalition against the US, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're going to implement their gold currency. I think that's like August 22nd through the 24th is the dates that they've laid out for that. I don't think that the U.S. is going to get left behind. I think that we're going to have something occur that's a catalyst that, that pushes us to the front of that. Um, they're not going to give up. <clears throat> I mean, they haven't given up reserve status of the currency very easily. Um and it'll be a multipolar world. It's not like one will win over the others. And that's the beauty of XRP, right? It just sits as a decentralized bridge that allows people to complete compete on a level playing field. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a price prediction or, I mean, there's a couple of different ways it could go, right? So if, let's say we get settlement, we get clarity, forward clarity on the asset um, and settlement, I think would it would end the case. Summary judgment won't end the case. A, a settlement will, mm -hmm. and then Ripple will IPO. You know, shortly after that, that they'll file their S one, and within thirty to ninety days, they'll IPO. Uh, and then you'd also get forward guidance on the asset, which would allow banks and institutions and everybody else here in the U.S. to use it. If it if it were designated uh, a security, I think it would only be designated a security prior to two thousand eighteen. And Ripple will have to pay fines for using the asset to produce income for the business that, you know, until it became decentralized 
And maybe that's what happens to Ethereum and a few of the other projects as well. We'll just have to see how things play out. But I think, you know, for a short period of time, it's there's a pretty safe bet that XRP is the only thing that has clarity. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, I've gone back and forth about the importance mm -hmm. of, of the US in terms of if it's called a security in the US, well, 90 something percent of the business for Ripple is outside of the US anyway, who cares? But actually, the, people do care, especially entities like the WEF and Bank of International Settlements and the World Bank. They actually do care because because the USA is one of those big players in the world and they're operating within that. It seems like, and I'll, I'll get your thoughts in a sec, it seems like the rest of the world is still waiting for that kind of through and through clarity throughout the world rather than just their just the implication for their country. We know, for example, in England, that we can operate and use these cryptocurrencies because we have the regulation, basically. But they're still holding back. And my only reason for thinking that and, and understanding that is because with this G20 roadmap that I've been digging into, it seems like you know cross-border specifically won't really be fully rolled out until the end of 2025. And so why are we... We're delaying because we've got regulation and we've got to put this infrastructure in uh, before it rolls out properly. But there's also an element of, well, we also have don't have the clarity across the world about this asset. And especially when we're talking about cross-border, it does involve the U.S. Yeah, the U.S. is the world's largest GDP, right? Um, China's a close second. I say close. It's, it's still it's a pretty big gap there. We, we consume a lot of the world's goods. And, and we will continue to do so into the future. At least I hope so. I hope that the standard of living doesn't drop here. Uh, I hope the rest of the world just comes up to meet us. So, yeah, with that, it would be like one third of the world's GDP just fell off the face of the planet if we disappeared and didn't participate. Um, and we would remove ourselves from the life source that we have that allows us to exists at the level that we do we don't produce anything here anymore uh i'm confident the the majority of the manufacturing will come back here uh after this transition takes place we're already starting to see it right like covid was a catalyst for a lot of people to understand that things weren't manufactured here in the u.s anymore and we've seen some some technological advancement that's kind of bolstered that that manufacturing here i'm here in in dallas i drive around and even in other locations that i've been to recently I've seen a ton of, of commercial and industrial buildings being built, large warehouses. Um, and you could point to Amazon, right? But they're not all of those. There, there needs to be infrastructure in place for the manufacturing to move back here. And I, I'm confident that that's being built and, and people know that that's coming and because they otherwise wouldn't be building it, right? Like it has to be profitable and maybe it's for other reasons there's tax reasons that they would build a giant building and then not rent it to offset other tax implications they have but i'm gonna bet in most scenarios that's not the case that um they they feel like you know somebody will rent that building and it'll be profitable and they'll be able to manufacture something there so <clears throat> yeah we'll have to see what yeah i'm with you like 2025 is really when I think everything's kind of rolled out and, and cemented and in use. Uh, I think we still got some volatility uh, until then, but uh, I think it will be pleasant volatility, unlike a lot of the stuff that we've been through up to this point. Yeah. So what what you what's your what's your plan in the volatility? Because I, I presume that the volatility incoming is still speculation based volatility what was the plan in that situation in in that situation i probably take some profits um and and maybe in the moment you won't know right is is this the deal where it's being used or is this just another run-up from volume on exchanges um the interesting thesis that somebody had put out I've been around a while, almost four years at this point for, for XRP and that side. There's people that have been around a lot longer than me, so I'm not saying I'm an OG or anything. But um, there was somebody that pointed out that if the volume on the public ledger, the price on the public ledger, got to a certain point that the 
side chains or or other components of the ledger would merge with that because then it would be able to facilitate transactions on those. And then those transactions could hold the price up, right? Because that's the price that it would require in order to facilitate whatever volume or or amount of money was moving through those channels. We've already looked at uh, DTCC and they have um, a ledger that's running in tandem with the DTCC, but obviously it can't facilitate settlement at the current price. So what if what if we have a speculative bull run that, that moves the price? And I know people are going to, you know, I think a speculative bull run, you could see 7 to $13 for XRP in particular, if, if that's what we're discussing. And, um, you know, there's a possibility if it was the only thing with clarity and you saw institutions step in with their money and wait behind it on the secondary market and and everybody that, you know, had been waiting to jump on this asset piles in at the same time, it's pushed through a centralized point, say uphold, say these other exchanges don't relist, right? And you've got volume just on that exchange or a few others that still have it internationally, obviously. There's multiple choices when it comes to that, but here in the U.S., we're we're pretty restricted. And then um, let's say you know people speculate that there's a lot of partnerships that, that Ripple has that haven't been announced yet. Maybe Amazon, Ripple, Google, um, a lot of these large corporations are going to be using this asset on their balance sheet to transact internationally. Airbnb, um, what's the, what's the car? Uber. Right. There's a lot of different companies that need to pay people in different currencies internationally. And right now that can be very costly and cumbersome for them to be able to do that. And the accounting is is rough. So, so it's pretty advantageous for them to leverage these channels as well. And they would need the asset in order to do that. Um, maybe we get news about pre-allocation of the escrow. And that it's, you know, held off of Ripple's balance sheet in some capacity. And they've leveraged that in some way that allowed them to, you know, sell it off if it met certain prices. Maybe these these companies didn't know if they were going to be successful or not. And they were like, all right, well, you know, at 50 or or $100, we're successful. Like, that's, that's a pretty good indicator of this asset and it being used if it's reaching these prices. So maybe that's when those vests for them. And they they take their portion. Um, I don't know. We could sit here and speculate about it all day long, but um, yeah, for me in particular, I'll be taking some profit in the short term if we didn't see real utility of the asset. Uh, if we do see real utility of the asset, um, I've got Holly Sign. We've got the account with them set up here through the family office, and we'll be looking to. We are actively looking to negotiate terms on loans against the asset uh, held there. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. It's absolutely mind-blowing to talk to. I wanted to tell everyone in here about this community huddle that I do within the Discord channel. If you go to the description, you join the Discord, you can be part of the community huddle, where I take your questions live on a voice chat within Discord, and we answer the questions, we bring people up to talk, to ask questions themselves, and it's just an amazing environment. The last couple of community huddles have been amazing and I now want to tell everyone about it in here. All you're gonna do is click the link in the description to join the Discord. It's absolutely free to be part of this and join the next one this Friday. Yeah, so I, I do wanna to touch on the, the PolySign thing a little bit later. I was gonna leave that to the end. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about PolySign right at the end there. Um, because I know so many people are interested. There's, I'll, I'll lead into it. Well, I've got a specific way I want to lead into that, but I want to okay. touch on the the eventuality that Ripple, uh, Ripple lose the case and they decide to to pack up shop and move outside of the US. Um, what does that look like in terms of their share price, for example, and the duration of time it takes to IPO if they're going to a different market to do so? Uh, would be, I don't want to say catastrophic. Uh, I don't feel like, you know, I think you, you would see the price on link to drop from where it is. Um, they're currently valuing it at somewhere close to 8 billion 
Right, right. And if we look at the assets on their balance sheet, um, it would indicate if they are on balance sheet, 22, well, 25 billion. If you had a 50 cent XRP, they got 50 billion in escrow. So what's the time frame on that? Well, yeah, it would be a, you wouldn't IPO on the London, on, on the New York Stock Exchange. It would be on the London Stock Exchange. They've recently met with the New York Stock Exchange, though, and there's a lot of indicators that they feel confident that it's going to end up being here. Maybe you're right. Maybe maybe the SEC blocks them, um, just blatantly goes around all of the information that's been presented, and somehow the judge rules that it's a security and can't be used in the capacity that, that Ripple wants it to. I think they could force the U.S.'s hand, and that's what I meant earlier, you know, where they just go, okay, we're go over here, and if you guys want to participate in the global economy and have access to these goods, you're just going to have to play nice and work with the rest of the world. Um, and that's a pretty high point of leverage, right? We'll see. I don't know. I don't know everything that's going on. I'm, I'm blessed enough to be here with you and, and have some friendships and discussions with people that I feel might have some inkling, right? But at the same time, I'm, I'm waiting just along with everybody else. I'm just trying to prepare um, for the different opportunities that will present themselves eventually, right? We know, we know how it works out long-term. It's just what transpires between now and then to get to there. I, uh, the last three or four years, I've, I felt like I've, I've known the end of the movie. Like your buddy tells you the ending and then you go watch the movie because you're like, how did we get, how does it start like this and end how you told me, you know, but you already know what the ending is. That's, that's how I felt the last three or four years is I know where we end up. I just don't know all the events that transpire or the catalysts that occur in order to achieve that. Yeah. That, there's a, there's this difficult balance, which I think everyone, everyone is feeling right now. And it's the, the concept of kind of managing our, wealth that doesn't exist <laughs> and uh it's it's a mental game that we have to play but it's also very serious um and the difficulty for me really and, and reason why i asked about that speculation pump in between here in utility is because your your strategy for how you manage your future wealth also kind of depends on time like if it's four years away or it's three years away Maybe some things are a little bit less urgent right now. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, for example, like setting up a company and having your assets in there. Maybe that can just be delayed for a little bit if we're not going to get much uh, happen. Um, but it, it's just a, a very difficult balance to be in. Another balance that is very difficult is balancing cold storage and and exchanges and holding holding assets on cold versus an exchange. Now, I would say 99% of people exist in that dilemma, right? Actually, I'm going to call it a bilemma because they only look at it as two, two different things, right? Um, exchange, custody, or cold storage wallet, and it ends there. Um, mm -hmm. The reason it ends there for most people is because the next level isn't achievable. Because when you look at the likes of institutional grade custody, which if you didn't hear about this already, then you've got to start diving into it because there's a third layer, which in my opinion, you know, blows the socks off cold storage wallet security. Um, because ultimately cold storage wallet security is only as secure as the house that you have your, your cold storage wallet device in. And I used the example like in, in the summer here in, and the same in Dallas, it gets super hot. If you leave your window open in your house and in your house, there is a safe with your cold storage wallet, your cold storage wallet is now there available with an open window. <laughs> like someone could just come in and take it. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of like that. And so although cold storage wallets are great and you have custody yourself, I mean, is the house always locked? Are the windows always closed? You know, it, it kind of gets a bit tricky. So the level above that is institutional grade. The problem with institutional grade is the barrier to entry, right? Because PolySign previously, or all these other 
uh, entities, you kind of have to be a million dollars plus or maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more in assets. And that's not us right now. So when you told me about the PolySign account that you've you've got for your family office, it kind of blew my mind <laughs> because you're now making institutional grade custody possible for at a lower barrier to entry. And I'd love to hear more about it. Really up to this point, you've, you've had three options. You've had cold wallet, hot wallet, and uh, exchanges, right? And with that, we, we've seen a lot of issues. I mean, Atomic just had issues recently where they were hacked and people lost some of the funds that were on their wallet. They might use a decentralized exchange there, and that's nice to have, but the security portion of that might be lacking. If you want to trade, then exchange is obviously going to be your best option. You want to be able to swap easily between assets. But then again, we've seen lots of exchanges have exposure, uh, FTX, um, Voyager, Celsius. And until those are regulated, um, you're going to continue to see that. They're, they're going to continue to leverage the assets in some capacity that they hold on their platform that provides some type of risk for those that are holding their assets there. Uh, Uphold, I don't feel is at risk. They do a really good job of maintaining their integrity and their backing. And I don't think that they're at risk for default. And they don't allow everybody to remove everything from their platform is another piece, right? So other people are upset about that. You know, you can't move your XLM off that platform, your HBAR or other things, but they also can't go under. So <laughs> which do you want, right? Um, and then with cold wallets, you've got uh, the Trezor, you've got Ledger, you've got Ellie Pal. There's a lot of different uh, paper wallets also, you know, that's kind of sketchy. It's not like you could look at it and see if it's there or not. You just kind of hope that your keys still work and nobody's hacked you. So with institutional grade custody, there's, there's a web portal. You can look at it. You can check your assets. You have full insurance on it. And then to be able to transact, if you wanted to trade, you'd have to move it off their platform. All they do is hold. Just hold your assets, fully insured, custody, um, and they're federally chartered. Well, I don't know if they're federally chartered, but they, they have their banking license in New York. Uh, they have a bit license for um, digital assets. And... I'm pretty sure they have licensure across the rest of the states as well. I can't hold stable coins in my account here in because I reside in Texas. So they do offer custody for USDC and a few others. But I guess there's legislation that's been passed here that my under my account, my clients can't hold that currently. They're they're looking to rectify that. But outside of that, um, the fees are a bit more than. Some of the cold storage wallets, right? Uh, if you're going to get like a Ledger Nano X, might be a couple hundred bucks. Um, this has a thousand dollar onboarding fee. Is the cost up front for this, uh, and then there is a monthly fee associated with that. And that's that's how Standard Custody makes their money, right? Because they don't leverage your assets. They're not making money off of you in any other way, or your assets in any other way. You're paying them to hold it and make sure that it's secure and for the insurance, right? So, makes sense to me. And then because we have our account there, um, we ideally would deal with only accredited investors. Um, anybody that participates under our account would be required to hold their assets in trust or holding company. Um, obviously, family office, like you're, you're going to need these entities at some point. Uh, maybe not now, like you pointed out, but it could be advantageous depending on how much you hold to move in there now. And then also what you're going to do with your assets. But um, yeah, with that, we're, we're able to offer a substantially lower threshold and barrier to entry with, with substantially lower fees. The monthly fees that are, we charge through our account are significantly less than what it is if you go direct. Um, you don't have to have the million dollars plus in digital assets to go direct with PolySign or be accredited. Um, you can come be a client of ours, and then our threshold is 100000 So it's one-tenth of what's required for uh, PolySign for, for us to hold your assets under our account. So just to list out the basically the requirements of an individual who might be interested in that, let's let's outline let's outline the the entry requirements just as, as a list. And then also the type of person 
and the way that these people might want to potentially use their assets in the future that make them a good fit for this solution. Right. So the qualifications currently, um, Standard Custody Trust only holds 31 assets at this time. So it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Solana, Avalanche, Matic, Chainlink, and then a bunch of DeFi protocols. So the, no XLM, no XDC, no HBAR, none of the other stuff that, you know, a lot of the people in, in your community in particular would think that are going to be advantageous in the future. Yep. So XRP is, is going to be the main holding of the majority of the people um, in the XRP community. Uh, maybe even the XDC community would be able to hold at PolySign under our account. Um, and then they would need to have those assets inside of an entity, right? So we work with our clients to file entities in a lot of different jurisdictions. If it's here in the US, the majority of that's held in Wyoming. Uh, our attorneys specialize in digital assets and, and the custody structures that are involved there. Um, we, we give you a pretty easy outline on how to move your assets into that and then um, work with you to, to set up the account with, with PolySign if that's something you choose. And then we talked about the fees. In the future, um, you'll have a couple different options in my mind, and we'll see if these transpire. I know that the loans will transpire. So that's what we're actively working on now. Um, we have some relationships with Swiss banks that are willing to loan on this asset as long as that they can, they can see the collateral, right? And so that's the other benefit of a qualified custodian. And what you're going to have to have, regardless of if you want to or not, if any other fiduciary is going to give you a loan against these assets, they're going to need visibility. Mm -hmm. They're not just going to say, hey, hope it's in your cold wallet. Have a nice day. Here's a couple million dollars. That's not how that's going to work. So um, there'll be a signatory on the account if you do take uh, a loan, potentially move to their FBO account, which will be in for the benefit of, um, or we're working to formalize an RIA underneath the family office that specializes in digital assets and we'll have an FBO account and potentially be able to offer loans ourselves. We'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, th that should transpire within the next three months here, one way or the other. And... With the advent of some price action, it would definitely bolster the ability to do that, especially if we had clarity, right? Um, Fidelity is already willing to loan. If, if you have Bitcoin or Ethereum and you want to work with us to custody those assets at uh, PolySign, they will issue loans against that current. And the terms on that are pretty favorable, um, somewhere around 5 or 6% at 75% uh, LTV. Okay. So obviously there's some volatility that's, that's involved there. But the other benefit outside of, you know, the loan, if you work inside of a DeFi protocol to do this, you're just going to get liquidated. If you, if your assets fall below the amount that they loaned you, they will liquidate and cover. Um, the benefit here is we've structured or working to structure terms into the loan where you get first right of refusal. So let's say you did take let's say you had a million dollars, you put it over here, you take a loan against 60% of it, you have 600,000 that you take out, uh, the value of your assets fall below that 600,000, and they move to liquidate, they're going to give you first right of refusal to buy them back to make them whole. So if you've got the 500,000 sitting over here, 550, 600,000 before they liquidate, they'll have a capital call, they'll ask you to fill the gap. If you can't fill the gap, that's when they will liquidate. But you'll get first right of refusal, which is not even an option on the DeFi protocols. Uh, you just lose your assets. So we're structuring this in a way that it's advantageous to those under our account to be able to take these loans and have the ability to purchase those assets back if they did fall below a certain threshold. And and to your point, you asked earlier, like, what, what would I do? If we have the ability to take loans against the asset, I might take, you know, a 20 or 30% loan against the asset at 3% in the short term until the volatility is gone. Cause I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're not going to see another 90% reduction from the current prices. Okay. We're, we've already seen that. Right. And so even to fall another 70% from here would be pretty significant. Uh, and you might get a flash crash, but it's going to come right back up. And that's, that's the other piece. You won't get liquidated during a flash crash. Um, hmm. If you, if you have lines of credit or loans against your stocks, they might have a capital call for you but they're not going to liquidate you. They know that that collateral is good and it's there. So 
things are changing uh, and that's a benefit. And then a separate of that is a lot of people have asked me about staking their assets with PolySign. They do offer staking for Solana, which I don't, I'm not sure if I mentioned that asset earlier, but they do hold Solana and it's delegated proof of stake. And you can actually earn interest on your Solana that's held in their account. Hmm. Uh, and I actually, because of the way this is structured and it's so difficult to get to your assets, I'm pretty confident that those are not taxed uh, at the point of distribution. Uh, other wallets might be because ease of access to those funds, but because it requires multi-person and multi-figure, um, multi-factor authentication just to get to your assets to move them and get them off the platform and utilize them in some way, pretty confident that that would qualify as a way to not receive those as taxable income here in the U.S. under the staking laws. But hopefully, with a lot of these other assets, um, I'm confident when the uh, the AMMs come online, which is the automated market maker, the amendment for the XRPO for that is XLS30D, that you'll be able to hold your assets here and delegate that liquidity to those pools. Now, I might be wrong on that. We don't know until everything comes out around it. But based on what I've read and what I've seen, conversation I had with David Schwartz, I'm I'm confident just just because of his involvement in all of them and how he structured um, the liquidity pools in a tax advantaged way when they make the money off the arbitrage. Um, I'm pretty confident he probably did this the same way. He's a pretty sharp guy. I think he could probably figure it out. So well, there's, I, there's a possibility. Go ahead. Are you? Did you? get the impression that he was more excited about the technological feat of the AMM or the amount of money it's going to make? Both. Yeah, I don't... He obviously nerds out on this stuff and has yeah. a lot of fun with it. And and the way he structured... So I had a gentleman comment on a video the other day um, and he you know complained that I explained arbitrage the wrong way. Or, or the uh, market makers the wrong way. And I try to make things simple for people, right? So other market makers don't take advantage of the arbitrage. They just make a market and then people are able to arbitrage against it and earn the full yield. That Those on the XRPL, they'll have to bid against uh, other people for the chance to arbitrage against the market maker. And the market maker gets whatever percentage uh, that they're willing to bet against that. So let's say that they were gonna make a hundred point spread they might be willing to bet 90 points or 92 points or 95 points and bid the LP tokens back to the pool to be able to earn that other smaller percent of arbitrage. And so the liquidity pool and the AMM actually ends up making the majority of the spread on the arbitrage that right. way, which has never been done before. And the way that he structured it, the, the LP tokens are burned once they go back into the pool. So it just increases the value of the other LP tokens in the pool and there are no distributions made, so it's not taxable. Mm. So, the the I've talked for a while about the the prospect of getting loans against your assets, right, in a regulated and insured environment. And I think one of the one of the I know you said it's fully insured, but insured up to fifty million dollars or something, isn't it? Yeah, per vault, and that's yeah. every client vault that we have under our account. So, if you just for viewers, think about that. Like you you. The, the level of insurance there is is liquidity event secure <laughs> like you're you're going to be you're going to be insured for to such a degree um but we've been talking about getting loans it's just happening now where you're you're at the forefront of this for xrp like you're at the cutting edge of the whole globe it feels like um so thanks for that effort but the idea that we're going to get loans against our xrp but the the added mind blow that the same assets that I've got the loan against, you might also be able to um, have them operating to generate a yield at the same time. So it's not a collateralize or earn. It's a collateralize and earn situation. And it comes from its position in PolySign in one of those accounts. That's that's the dream. Yeah. yeah. It, it, basically, the yeah. asset pays for itself, pays off the loan that you took against it. Yeah. I mean, that's just the infinite money glitch. <laughs> um, yes. So I, I'd be interested, um, just before you kind of let everyone know uh, kind of where they where they can find you and how they can access that to talk to you more about how they could do that. 
Um, I forgot my question now, but I've completely forgotten it. I went blank. Jake, I went blank. Hey, it happens, brother. I do it all the time. Yeah, but my lion's mane should not be doing this to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had a we had a good conversation about that, the mastermind, the other day. Yeah, I know. I love that. I love one of my favorite one of my favorite conversations we've had in there. Um, it's surprising how many people are conscious about improving their like mentality and their, their physicality. It was interesting. Well, I mean, what's what's your wealth if you don't have health, right? Like if you're not able to be competent and go do things and have fun and move around. Um, there's a lot of people that have a lot of money and are sick, and they would they would trade all their money for to be healthy again, right? So, yeah, it's an, another it's a huge component of what people should be thinking about when they're you know, planning their future life. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So would you be able to let everyone know if they are the type of individual who I, I would say, I, I mean, you can clarify. Is well, this I want to point out something else. You, yeah. You're in the UK. Um, we do have international parties that, that are under our account and are currently working to, with us to hold their assets at PolySign. So they, they cannot advertise that um, because of the laws and, and the regulations here. Um, but we can, we work with international parties. Uh, we're working to get other competent professionals and other jurisdictions for tax mitigation, estate planning, uh, CPAs, all the other things. We're actively working on that front. So if this is something you're interested in, you are in another country, uh, we're able to provide that this service for you as well. Excellent. And where can they find you? Yeah, so if, if you want to go to digitalfamilyoffice.io, that's where we're going to have a link um, for the, the custody portal. You'll just put your information in. Um, and then, uh, obviously, the mastermind. Uh, we've got uh, mastermind.beyondbroke.com where we discuss, you know, all the wonderful things that are uh, financial pieces, uh, including private investment, um, how to manage your money and wealth, and then uh, financial resources and, and business resources as well. And and I can I can say because I'm in in the mastermind, it's one of the most valuable things I've ever been a part of. So uh, I don't know I don't know how else to kind of put it. Uh, that's that's the simple way to put it, and it's the most accurate way to put it. Um, thank you for all your efforts in the space and giving clarity in such uh, a mind bogglingly bogglingly confusing space. Um, we we thought blockchain was hard enough to to kind of overcome, but now. Yeah wealth wealth creation wealth maintenance wealth generation like it, it, all of it wealth planning this is a whole new frontier for so many people and you're making it a lot easier i appreciate that that's what we're trying to do just provide you know the education around this stuff people are hungry for it but they don't know where to look and um i've just been lucky enough to, to be around the professionals that um have a lot of this information and, and they've been mentors for me and I'm, I'm happy to pass it on to the people that uh are going to be able to use it great well thank you very much for the conversation i'm sure we'll do another one when a when a new feature comes out or something <laughs> or, or a new a new uh frontier has been breached um but anyway, thank you very much thank you for having me we'll see you lewis if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit like. You can also click this video to see any of the other interviews that I do on my podcast. Very interesting. The other video is a video that the algorithm believes is perfect for you. You can also click my face just before you go to subscribe if you enjoyed this. Stay emotionless and I'll see you in the next one.